How many of you guys know God is good, right? God is good, right? How many of you guys are glad to be here today? Anybody glad to be here today? Yeah. We're glad that you're here. We're glad for all of our house church uh, people who are still with us on house church as well. And we're continuing our series called Legacy. And uh, I'm going to start off with a story that's a fame. It's a famous story. It's a true story. You may or may not have heard it. Uh, it's a true story, but some of the details are kind of debated, but you'll get the point. It's a story of, about a guy named Max in, in the 1700s. And a guy named Max in the 1700s, he wasn't a guy who lived for God. Some people said he was an atheist. Some people debate that. Um, but he was just not really a, a great guy, it sounds like. He just lived a life and didn't really pay too much attention to God. And at worst, he was against God. And it was in the 1700s. And there was another guy named Jonathan who lived about the same time. And somebody years and years later documented these two people's family tree. And, and to see what happened. Because you had Jonathan, who was a follower of Jesus. He was uh, all out, all in, on fire for God. And he was, I mean, he lived a life of integrity. He lived a life of faith. In fact, some of you guys might have heard of this guy. His name is Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards was, uh, he was one of the instrumental uh, leaders of the First Great Awakening. And mighty revival happened during his time. A mighty revival happened during his day, and he lived for God. So you have a guy named Max and a guy named Jonathan, and somebody detailed out their descendants. And Max's descendants, 560 known descendants, there were seven murderers, 60 thieves, 100 alcoholics, 50% 50 of the women became prostitutes, 300 of them died prematurely. That's not really the greatest legacy that you want to leave, right? On the flip side, the guy who lived all out for God, uh, some, again, some of these numbers are debated, but you'll get the idea. Uh, they say 300 preachers, 295 college graduates, 65 college professors, including 13 college presidents, 100 missionaries, 100 lawyers, 75 military officers, 56 physicians, including one dean of a medical school, 80 held public office, including one vice president. Now, how many of you guys, if you had to pick one of those legacies, which one would you pick, right? I think all of us, we want, to, we want to have a family tree that honors God. We want to have a legacy that rings out, that has a ripple effect. Uh, we want to pass that on. We want, how many of you guys would like that to be your story? Not Max's story, but Jonathan's story one day, right? I think we would love to be able to look back and look down like a great cloud of witnesses from heaven, looking down and cheering on those who have gone after us. So we're talking about a legacy, and here's what the definition is. Webster's Dictionary, a gift by will, especially of money or other personal property. Second definition is something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past. So if you'll remember a couple weeks ago, I had an illustration up here with these chairs, right? I had a small chair and a slightly bigger chair and then a, a bigger chair and then the biggest chair, right? And it was just to illustrate this idea of growing up in the natural and growing up in God. And so the first chair was a spiritual infant. The second chair was a spiritual child. Everything's kind of about them. Then a, a young adult or a teenager where they're starting to figure out there are other people in the world. They can make a contribution. And then spiritual mothers and fathers in the family faith who then pass down and pull people towards where they're at as well. Now, my hunch is that Jonathan Edwards, he grew to this chair over here, right? He grew and he had to keep moving and keep growing in God to get there. And so have you ever wondered, and you looked at some people and you wondered why some people seem to grow and why other people seem to stagnate? I mean, you look at some people and you're like, man, they just seemed like like you either, one, you think they've always been at this spiritual place, right? Or you're thinking, how did they go there and yet this other person did not? That's really what I want to talk about today. And, and that's really what God has been putting on my heart actually for the last couple years. And, and uh, God gave me some, uh, he gave me a clue. He gave me actually three ingredients of people who grow in their faith, of people who grow. And since I'm a pastor, they all start with the same letter. And that's what, just what he did, right? So, but he started to unfold this uh, over the last couple of years. And they're, they're very simple, but they hold true. And, and so over this time, God began to show me a pattern of those who grow in a small group and those who do not. 
of those who grow in their relationship with God and those who do not, of those who grow into stronger, into new levels and those who do not, of those who start to go into ministry versus those who, who were called and did not, those who, who start things and those who did not, those who start sharing their faith, those who start using their spiritual gifts and those who do not. And so I'm gonna share that today, what those three things are. And the first thing is this, those who grow simply have a hunger. They just have a hunger for God. I, I've kind of analyzed it every way I can, and, and, but this is the ingredient. They just have a hunger, hunger for God. One of my favorite verses that God has been dealing with me over the last couple years is found in Psalm chapter 107, verse one through nine. It says this, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered from in from the lands, the land from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. And this is one of my favorite parts uh, and one of my favorite scriptures. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. You know, you go into the New Testament and Jesus himself said, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, those are the ones who are going to be filled. Does anybody hunger? Anybody have a hunger in you? I mean, physically, anybody have a hunger? I do, like right now. I am like hungry right now. And, and there, that, that, that happens in the natural, but it also happens spiritually. I, I said this a couple years ago. God showed this to me, that you can be so hungry that you lose your appetite. See, there's a difference between appetite and hunger. And, and, and I would say it this way. Hunger is a physical need for food. Appetite is a desire for food. You can actually be starving and yet lose your appetite. And, and here's why this is important. We're going to put it up so you can write it down and remember it. But my appetite drives me to the thing I love. See, I may be hung, I may have a starvation on the inside of me for God, but sometimes you can go so long without filling up that you can actually lose your appetite. And the appetite for God, your appetite for anything drives you to the things that you love. But, and so in January of 2017, we did a fast. And several of you guys were doing that fast. We actually fasted for 21 days, no food, water, and a little bit of juice. Some people asked me when I was done with that, can you live? Think about it. Loosen up, people. Think about it, okay? They asked me after I was done, can you survive that? And I would just look at them. And it wasn't just one person. It was multiple people that asked me that. I'm like, yes, you can. But, but so, so 21 days, no food. You kind of get, here's what happens if you've never done that before. You get to a point, now at least I do. I get to a point a couple weeks in where I haven't had food for day after day after day after day. My body is wanting some sort of nutrients, right? It needs nutrients. I can feel the energy loss, all of that stuff. But you get to a point where you wake up one day and you realize, I'm just not hungry. And if you think about food, maybe, maybe something kind of kicks in, but if you're not really thinking about it, you've gone past all of the physiological stuff where your stomach is churning and all, you get past all of that. And you get to this place where you're actually, you don't feel hungry anymore. And it's scary. I remember feeling scared. Like, I know if I keep doing this, I'll, I will die. And I will, I will no longer exist, but I'm not hungry. I believe the same thing can happen to us spiritually. I believe you can get to a point where you stop filling up and you stop hungering after God and you stop feeding on spiritual food and nourishment and fellowship and all of those things so long that you get to a point where you have no more appetite for the things of God, for the people of God, for the activities of God, for the kingdom of God, all while starving underneath. 
And I see so many people who get to this point where they're just like, well, I'm just not hungry for God. No, they're starving for God. But they've gone so long that they no longer have an appetite for God. And the difference between those who grow and those who don't are those who are aware that I have to continually feed myself with the word of God. I have to continually feed myself with the fellowship of God's people. I have to continually hunger after God, even on the days when I don't feel like it because I know I need it. Those are the people who tend to grow against those who do not. So I don't know whether... The hunger is all on God's side where God just deposits a hunger in you and like, oh, I'm hungry for God. Or if it's all on the person's side where it's like, well, I gotta stir up a hunger for God. My my hunch is it's both. The Bible says in James, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. At some point when some of us lose our appetite, we stop drawing near. And it's not that God has left, God's still there. We just have lost our appetite for God. And if you want to grow to a place where you can pour back into a next generation, where you can pour back into your spouse or into your family, then there has to be a hunger on the inside of you. And I don't know how to detail out how to get that. I'm just telling you, you have to be aware of it. The second thing, again, it's gonna start with the same letter, okay? Just, Just prepare for that. The second thing that I've seen for those who continue to grow and those who stagnate is humility. This is a big deal because so many times we get to the point where we think no one can tell me what to do. I've know, I know it all or I, I've got it figured out or I read this book, I listened to this podcast, I did this thing. Humility is like, it's like willingness to be discipled. Humility, humility is like a willingness to be corrected. Humility is a willingness to repent. Humility is, is a, it, let me say this way, growth does not happen without change, and change cannot happen unless we first realize there's something that needs to change. Humility takes us to the point where we realize that something has to change, but you only get to that point with humility and through humility. And and change doesn't happen unless we first admit we're not right in our current state, or we're at least open to someone who we trust to tell us that and to speak into our lives. So one of the things I'm doing throughout this series is I'm introducing you to people who have spoke into my life, who've had a big impact in my life. And one of them is a guy named Clint Sprague. And Clint Sprague, um, I, I, we kind of get into it and talk about it. It's a little bit uh, longer, but there were so many good things that we ended up talking about. I was like, I have, to, I have to share this with you. So here's my recent conversation with Pastor Clint Sprague. I meet you when I was already left full faith but before yeah. I went to Michigan right I think so I think yeah. so. so it would have went it would have been I graduated from Bible College in 98 moved to Tulsa and I was doing the mobile ministry thing and I think at that time you were working for uh for Tom or with yeah. Tom yeah yeah so, so we've known each other 99 is good 21 years golly that's crazy, <laughs> crazy. So then you started Life Mission like in 2002, right? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. 2002. So then 2004, um, I had kind of, I had a situation. I had to leave. It was kind of, at the time, I felt like it was kind of a toxic situation. I was kind of trying to figure out what was next. And I lived in St. Joe, Missouri at the time. And like whenever you get in those situations where it's like, uh, you know, maybe you're in a position where it's like you're hurt or you're just confused or whatever. And I was trying to figure out like, what's next? Where can I go um, where I can trust what's happening and all those sorts of things? And I thought of you and I thought of the church that you started. And I thought, man, I can trust this guy. And I just kind of had that vibe about you, that feeling about you. And so we drove from St. Joe all the way down to Olathe to church every single weekend. You remember those days? And- oh, yeah, your whole tribe. It wasn't just your family. It was your brothers. And <laughs> it was like, are the Phillips coming or not? Because if the Phillips come, we're going to have to open up some more rooms. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so we did that. And during that time, I don't know if you remember or not, but you gave me a book when I was going through that. Um, a long time ago, and it really helped shift my thinking because I was thinking, you know how you are in those situations, like I'm right, this is the right thing. And you gave me this book because you'd been through some different things and it just really helped shift 
from even if I was right in the situation, it allowed me to start to walk with a little more humility towards the situation. And that was such a key time in my life. And I remember you saying, I mean, I felt like a spiritual orphan during that time. And I think you even said something like, I'll be your adoptive pastor or something like that. And, and you brought us in and I just saw um, all of that. You just modeled all of that. And so first, I just want to thank you for taking the time to do this. And thanks for being that example, that big brother in the faith uh, mm. to me and, and the friendship that uh, Becca and I have with you and Mary has just been invaluable. Mm. And uh, I'm so honored to be a part of that. And I've just watched this. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I've just watched humility come from you guys. Mm. And that's really what I'm talking about today is humility. And I've watched you guys model that in different situations, even with your family and the way you handle church things, um, the way you've presented that to me and just walked that out. So I'm going to put you on the spot here and just ask you, what is your definition of humility or how would you really define that? Well, I think humility gets a bad rap because people tend to think of it as being weak, but it's actually the strongest posture that you could have. Um, I heard a wise man who's wiser than me many years ago who defined uh, humility this way. He said, humility is being known for who you are, nothing more, which is what we get, right? And uh, mm -hmm. we understand that part, but also nothing less. So let me say it again. Mm -hmm. Humility is being known for who you are, nothing more and nothing less. So if you think about it, it's authenticity, it's transparency. And the beauty of humility is it opens all kinds of doors for us, obviously in our relationship with the Lord, um, but also in our relationships with others, because you don't bring pretense, you don't pose, you don't pretend, you don't have to posture yourself in such a way that you're trying to prove something or earn something. You just be honest, man. And uh, I think it's uh, unfortunately too often humility is um, kind of down the, the pecking order in our priority list. But when I look at the kingdom, I looked at Jesus, um, I look at the promises of God, uh, humility is everywhere in there. Yeah. Well, I, for me, a side of that that I've had to learn, I mean, one of the things I've been thinking about is, is humility is kind of also um, willing, a willingness to be discipled or yeah. to come into relationship with other people. And I had to really learn that. I mean, when we started the church, you know, I'm like, I'm going to be independent. I'm going to just go for it. And you kept pulling me back, pulling me back and saying, there's a better way and there's a better way. And, and finally I started to lean into that. And that's one thing that I saw you guys model from the beginning was to have these counselors, a willingness to, to yield, a willingness to come under authority. Um, and you have that, like, I mean, I'm still learning how to do that in a lot of ways and have, you know, watched you model that. Mm -hmm. And so what does that look like? Uh, I mean, how did you learn that? Did you see that model? How did you pick up that healthy habit? Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I had good role models in my life. Um, I've seen kind of excesses. When you talk about church government, you talk about church planting. Obviously, I'm in that world continually now. Um, but, you know, denominations have had kind of a system over the years that gets real uh, kind of heavy on oversight and systems and and you lose a lot of that free spirited, you know, entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, that's what you have. You have an entrepreneurial spirit, you're creative, you're inspired. And so a lot of times guys tend to bounce out of denominations and say, I'm going to be non-denominational, I'm going to do my own thing. And, um, and it can come across as a rebellious spirit. But a lot of times it's really just that, you know, creative, you know, get her done type of personality but with that, you got to be careful you don't move into rebellion. So I believe there's a balance. I think oversight and denominationalism can be really a hindrance to the kingdom of God, but I also believe a lone ranger mentality is as well. And so I think the Bible is our, it's our pathway. We look at scripture and God called prophets and priests and, you know, apostles all throughout scripture to take a stand, to take new land. You look at the apostle Paul planting churches but even as he had that model of planting churches, he had Timothy's and Titus and Barnabas, and he had these other people around him that, um, that he stayed in their lives. I mean, we have the epistles because of that, right? So they were pastors, they were leaders in their communities, and yet they were under uh, some level of authority. And Paul was that way in his early days. He looked to Barnabas, he looked to Peter and those guys. So um, I, you just look all the way back to Jesus and his disciples. There was that model of having people that speak into your life and having people that you speak into. And we do that simultaneously. 
not in a controlling way or in some kind of a, you know, top down management model, but a relational accountability and teachability is huge. And um, I was a little worried about you there for a little bit because you come out of a movement and you knew God had a call in your life. Right. And the tendency is to say, I don't want anybody to kind of hinder what God's got in my heart, you know? Mm -hmm. So the key is finding the right people that'll value your gifts, value your calling, but also value you enough to speak the truth in love and to kind of warn you, say, Oh, whoa, whoa, slow down here. Or, or even speed up like, man, you know what? Don't get comfortable. So you need healthy models and men of God, women in your life that, that will speak into your life and remind you who you are and whose you are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so good. And like, like you're saying, there are some tough conversations. I mean, you and I've had some tough conversations before where that's what we need to be able to grow in those ways. And I've just seen you model that. I mean, I remember, what was it? 2013, you took a sabbatical. Was it, was it that long ago? It's something like that. that. I'm I, I remember you saying that, that you, the people in your life like spoke that into you and just said, Hey, you need to do this. Yeah. And I watched you probably, even though you may not have thought you needed to do that, you, you humbled yourself and just said, Hey, people I trust are telling me this and I'm going to walk this out. And I watched you do that. And that inspired me to take a sabbatical, which was a game changer in my life a couple years ago. And just watching yeah. you go through that. Yeah. So I have uh, pastors in my life. Pastor Dwayne Vanderklok, obviously, is my apostolic oversight. He's the one that commissioned us from Michigan to come down and plant this church in Kansas City. Well, you know, I'm on the Kansas side. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost 18 years ago, if you can believe that, that we started Life Mission. And um, and he's still my pastor. And then I have other pastoral influence, Pastor Bobby Bogart, who you know well. He was actually the one really encouraging me to take a sabbatical. At that point in 2013, uh, we were 11 years into our church plant, and I had just been plowing, plowing, plowing. And we'd also already planted, uh, you know, a church and a campus. And so uh, I think it's really wisdom for all of us to learn to Sabbath, not just sabbaticals, but to Sabbath in a normal rhythm. You know, it's an act of humility to say, I want to take my hands off the wheel. Right. Uh, and I'm just going to be with God, be with my family. I'm going to relax. I'm going to do what the Bible says, right? And trust. It's kind of like when we tithe. You know, we tithe, we say, I'm going to give God the first 10th and I'm going to trust God with the 90. That's an act of humility, but it's an act of faith, right? To say, God, everything I have belongs to you. The Sabbath is very similar. When we say, you know what? I can do in six days better than what I can do in seven if I honor the Lord with the Sabbath. And sabbaticals are like that as well. But we say, you know, I'm, and for me, like letting go, I was gone for you know a couple of months. Um, it was six weeks was my official sabbatical, but then there was kind of a phase back in. And, um, you know, letting go and letting God and letting my staff, it definitely took some vulnerability. Uh, but it also, you humble yourself and you realize, you know what, the church doesn't revolve around me. And right. uh, it did just fine when I was gone. So uh, that's, an, that's humiliating or it's humbling. You know, that's a choice we always have. We'll either be humbled by our, humiliated by our pride. Yeah. Or we can humble ourselves. And the Bible says God lifts us up, right? What's it say in James 4, 6? It says God opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble. And I, if I'm going to choose between God resisting me, I'm thinking about who that is. It's one thing to have friends or foes resist you, but God himself resists you. I don't want any part of that, right? right. Um, but it's grace to the humble. So I'm going to err on the side of humility. That's, that's right. for self-preservation. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, our church grew when I went on sabbatical, so that was interesting. Um, but you've, you've been uh, one of our overseers of our church, and I'm just so thankful uh, for what you guys speak into our life. I just wanted to let you know how much we respect you, how much we love you guys, how much we honor you guys. Um, you have no idea the impact that you've had on us, on uh, Becca and me personally, and our, our friendship, our relationship, and your leadership. So I just want to thank you for that and for the time you put in and for the legacy you're depositing in us. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. I want you to know I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of both of you and, and your family and uh, how amazing you guys have done there. And I know that there's been challenges along the way and you keep hitting these lids and all these things. And I, and I just want to just celebrate your teachability and your willingness to try new things, but also your perseverance. Like you guys just have a, I'm not going to quit mentality, you know, and uh, for anybody that's listening to this that, you know, hasn't planted a church and hasn't led a church, let me tell you, there are attacks all along the way. And you have a great pastor that um, stays the course and is strong 
Uh, there's this term I use a lot with my, my leaders. I said, you know, we need to live in a place of confident humility. Mm. So we know who we are, nothing more, nothing less. We're humble. We humble ourselves before God, but we're confident because of who our God is. So as we humble ourselves before him, I can be confident. And that is the balance that I see in scripture is I humble myself before God and I'm humble before people. Like I need to be that way, but I'm also confident for the enemy. Like, you know what? You're not going to take any ground because I'm a son of the most high God. I've been called. I've been set apart. Uh, I've been set free from the lies of the enemy. And so that's not pride. That's, that's confidence in who God's called us to be. And yeah. I've seen that in you and back end. Just really proud of you guys. And I love you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time, man. I love All you. Right, man. We'll see you later. Good stuff. You, you see why I played the whole thing. It just, just kept getting better, right? Let, let me tell you something about humility and accountability. I just thought of this right now, but hum, accountability, I tell my kids this. It, in one sense, probably in the most important sense, accountability, you talk about accountability partners or accountability in your life or whatever, accountability can only be invited. It can never really be imposed. Why do I say that? Because you can find a way around any accountability structure that's set up in your life. You can find a way eventually to find a way where you start not being honest again, where you start hiding things around or whatever it is. So accountability, true accountability can only be invited where it says, I want to I wanna bring myself into this accountability. And that, that's really what I had to do with uh, guys like Clint in my life, where where. You know, a couple years into planting the church, I realized I need people like this in my life. And so I had to humble myself and, and for the good of our church and to bring ourselves over to this place where I invited accountability. That's the way it works. And so humility, it, it's in, in our, our, the problem we have in our individualistic, free agent society, our church hopper, pick a podcast mindset society, we seem to have a hard time being willing to sit at the feet of somebody who wants to pour some things into our life. Because as soon as they say something we don't like, we, we just go find another person. And I'm not saying to blindly follow people or put people up on pedestals, but what I am saying is if you come into every conversation or every relationship and you can opt in and opt out really, really quickly, or you assume you have all of the right answers from the very beginning, that's not walking in humility. And the people I've seen grow are the people who said, you know what, they walk into a small group and they say, you know what, I think I know where I'm at, but I sure wanna hear what these people that I love and trust as brothers and sisters in God, in Christ, what they're gonna say. And I've just gotta open up my heart. And those people tend to grow. All right, number three, the last one, what letter do you think it starts with? <laughs> you guys are paying attention. This is like Sesame Street, okay? It's awesome. <clears throat> but this one, is really big. The ingredient, and this is, it's really, I mean, it sounds trivial for me to say it this way, but it's the Holy Spirit. People who grow invite the Holy Spirit into their lives, into a process of growth. See, the way that we're ultimately changed and we ultimately grow by one, the finished work of Jesus Christ. Whenever you understand what Jesus has already done, what he's already given us of who we are in him, that we are already established, that the righteousness of God has been given to us as a gift, that he's done everything that needs to be done on the cross, that's one level. When you realize that by revelation, you realize who you are and what Jesus has done. There's growth that happens just in that finished work of Christ. But it also, we also grow because of the finished work of Jesus and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. See, he gave us the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, verse 16. And he says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you a helper, another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is what Jesus came to do and what he gives the Holy Spirit to do. Not just so that we can live good moral lives, but so that we can actually be transformed in him. Not just so we can have right behavior, but so that our heart will actually be brand new and new creations and that we continue to be uh, kingdom expanders. That, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to do this. Now, Depending on your background, when I say the word, when I say the name Holy Spirit, you, you might tend to go one of two places. Well, you can go a lot of places, but most people kind of end up over here. They'll end up in the gifts of the Spirit, 
And we think about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, if I'm going to grow in God, man, I need the power of God. I need to give to the Holy Spirit. I need all this stuff that God's going to do and pour it in me, pour it in me, pour it in me and use me, use me, use me and all that stuff. So we tend to be over here or we tend to think about the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the fruit of the Holy Spirit over in Galatians chapter five, like love, joy, peace. And we kind of like, yeah, if I'm going to grow, I need to grow in love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, self-control. But the truth of the matter is the Holy Spirit's work in us is bigger than all of those, bigger than both of those combined. I mean, the, he leads us, he guides us, he comforts us, he convicts us, he ch changes us in so many ways through all of those different ways. So we shouldn't just pay attention to one of those. What we, what we really ought to be doing is coming before the Holy Spirit and paying attention to the movement of the Holy Spirit in our heart. Because he might move us by wanting to use us in a gift, or he might move us by wanting fruit to bear fruit in us, or he might move us by convicting us of something. And we pay attention to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And the Holy Spirit only works in our life through invitation. And let me, let me just say it this way very simply. Impartation comes through invitation. It starts by invitation. You, you're not going to, as I said, you don't drift up into growth generally. It's usually a partnership with God where you invite the Holy Spirit. So how would you, how would you do that? Let, let me just share just a real quick thing as we're getting ready to wrap up here. A real quick thing that I felt like I should challenge some of you, maybe not for everybody, but if you're here today or you're watching today and you're wondering how can I lean into this, here's an idea. What if you went through, just started going through the New Testament or did a word search or whatever, and you found every place where it talks about the Holy Spirit? You might see gifts of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, power of the Holy Spirit, conviction, whatever it is. And when you read that, you simply said something like this, Holy Spirit, would you do that in me? You come to another spot in Scripture, and maybe there's a gift of the Spirit that's flowing. You say, would you do that in me? Maybe you go to another point and you, you see the power of the Holy Spirit operating or you see a conviction or a repentance. You know, the Holy Spirit ultimately leads us to Jesus. And if you just go through and say, would you do that in me? What is that? That's hunger for God. That's humility. And that's an invitation. Those are the ingredients that I've seen of people who tend to grow. Now, let me close up with another story that maybe you've heard before. I heard it a long time ago. Just an illustration. Because one of the main things that the Holy Spirit can do in us is bring revelation. He brings revelation. We're all of a sudden, see, it's not just information that we need, it's revelation. See, information, you can have knowledge all day long and it not change your life. But when the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, there's power behind it. And we need revelation from the Holy Spirit. I heard this illustration a long time ago. Somebody was walking by, and there was a circus going on. Somebody's walking by, there was this big, huge elephant in the circus, and, and the person is looking at this, and they notice like this elephant is just standing outside the tent, and he's just held by just this little rope around his ankle and just a, a stake in the ground. And the guy is like really curious, like, how is this elephant not like bulldozing down this tent and, and hurting people or running away? It's just, I mean, nobody's really watching it. It's just sitting here with a stake and a little rope. How does that happen? So he went up and he asked one of the, the trainers, one of the handlers, he's like, how does this happen? I mean, this elephant can just run over people right now. And he said, well, what we do is when the elephant is really small, we use the same stake and the same rope. And when the elephant is small, he doesn't have as much strength to, to do this. And so when he's small, you, you drive that stake down and he tries to pull against that rope and he can't go. And he keeps trying, and he keeps trying, and he keeps trying. Eventually, he gets tired of it and he stops. And so whenever he started to grow, he would feel just a little tug on his leg and he would just stop. So that as the elephant continued to grow, whenever it would start to walk and it felt just a little tug, it wouldn't even try to pull it out of the ground. How many of you guys know that elephant could just rip that stake right out, right? But somewhere along the way, the elephant decided that he was trapped. The elephant decided that this is his lot in life, that this is what's going to hold him back, even though the truth is that he could break free at any time. See, that's what Satan does to us. 
He conditions our thought life by lies and deception over time, maybe some bad experiences over time, so that whenever we, have, we, we walk into a certain environment or a certain relationship or whatever, we feel the tug of the rope and we just say, this is the way it's going to be. This is just who I am. This is just my personality. This is just the way I grew up. This is just my lot in life. And we feel the tug, and every time we finally just resign ourselves that this is the way it's going to be. But the truth is, if somebody could actually talk to that elephant and say, hey, you can pull that thing up. That elephant could be free. It could be tearing up stuff. Whatever it wanted to do, right? It could be having fun. And the fact of the matter is, for some of us, we want to grow. And you think, you think there's a lid. You think there's a rope that's holding you back. And whenever we invite the Holy Spirit into the process through humility and a hunger for God, there are times through revelation, all of a sudden, the curtain is pulled back. And I believe, I don't know what your situation is, but I believe that the Holy Spirit will do that for some people here tonight. That you feel like I'm just stuck at this one level. I'm just stuck. I just can't seem to grow. That in one moment of revelation by invitation of the Holy Spirit, everything can change. So would you guys stand up with me? We're going to have the worship team come back up as we get ready to wrap up. And I'm going to pray over us. Maybe just put yourself in a posture to receive. God, we want to grow. We want to grow in you. We want to grow to the place where we pour back into others and we leave a legacy in other people's lives of, of you, of the kingdom, of your power, of your depositing these things in other people. God, that's where we want to get to. We want to grow to that. Well, God, I know that you can use us wherever we're at, whatever stage. But I know we don't want to stay where we are. I know we don't want to stay the same. So Lord, I pray right now for those who maybe have lost their appetite for you or for their calling or their dream or to grow or to be in relationship, whatever it is. Holy Spirit, would you by revelation pull the curtain back for them just right now and let them know how hungry they actually are for you. But even if they don't feel it, it's not about feelings. I pray by revelation right now that there would stir up a hunger on the inside. Holy Spirit, we invite you and we just simply pray this prayer. Would you do that in me? Would you do that through me? Would you do that in me tonight? Would you do that in me today, God? Lord, we yield to you right now. God, we say we're, we're all yours. We want to, we want to yield ourselves and invite the accountability that you bring. And your accountability comes with freedom. Lord, I speak that over us. It's for freedom that you've set us free. I speak right now to those people who've wondered off the path and they, they wonder if, if, if they can ever get back. Lord, I pray right now for that person that they would understand right now that, that you are right there, that your calling is still the same. Lord, I pray for that person who've, who's maybe set things on the side and they said, this, this relationship will never work. This thing is just, it's over, it's too far gone. Lord, I pray right now that there would be a dream that would awaken in them again. Lord, we speak life, we speak freedom. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this time right now. And I pray even during this last moment that we have here that you'd bring your revelation to us in Jesus' name.